Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for September the 11th, 2020. This is episode number 23. Today, we'll be talking about the official launch of the Lucid Air, Nikola finding a manufacturing partner in General Motors, Electrify America fails its East Coast customers. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Auto Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the, pa gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. So I, I just wanted to start by saying that today is like the 19th anniversary of a, of a horrible, horrible day. And uh, the, the loss of that day still hurts our hearts, my heart, and I'm sure everybody. And, and those lost remain in our memories. And, you know, it makes every year this day comes up and it's it's hard every time. But, yeah, I just want to put that out there. So, but we should, we're here to talk about EVs. And so let's do that. Uh, before we jump into the big news of the week, though, I heard that you had an interesting talk with the CTO of Goodyear, Kyle, about Goodyear tires. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Right. Yeah, we absolutely should. I, and I really think they uh, did an amazing job. First off, Goodyear reached out to us to try to tell us about their tires. And, you know, I love tires and I'm like, let's, let's geek out. So uh, we basically had a, a 30 minute, maybe an hour long conversation lined up with Chris Helsel, who's the CTO of Goodyear Tires, Chief Technology Officer. And we got real geeky. It was fantastic. We talked a lot about what makes tires good for electric cars, the engineering compromises. Actually, Dominic wrote a great article, and I believe you used the phrase symphony of compromises. I thought it was Thank really you. great. And uh, basically, you have to balance range, uh, grip, which are two things, so rolling resistance and overall tire grip, which work opposite of each other. And then you also need uh, great NVH, so noise uh, isolation, so you can put foam inside the tire. Uh, and then you have special polymers that they're developing and working on. However, more interesting than that, by the way, the Model S was able to get 402 miles EPA on Goodyear tires. Yeah. Uh, so props to them for working with Tesla on that. But more interesting than all of that was the conversation we had about future product. Of course, we're using pneumatic tires, air-filled rubber tires. Uh, but in the future, uh, the, I don't expect that to change too much, but think about this, with autonomous vehicles, you will not have someone basically looking at the tread depth all the time. And as you know, tires change their behavior based on usage. So an AV system needs to be programmed to understand how much tire tread is left on the tires on the vehicle and then adapt its driving and program driving style to match those tires. It's things we do subconsciously of, as a human driver. If we put in this much steering and it's not steering too much, we put in more and we can adjust. But uh, for AVs, this is something that needs to be programmed in. And so they are working on sensor technology that goes on the inside of the tire to measure tread depth. And I just thought that was genius. That's so cool. Uh, and they're also working on airless tires and things like this. But uh, really great conversation with Chris. Got super geeky. Loved it. Go watch the video on our Inside EVs YouTube channel and read Dominic's article if you're interested to learn more. Right on. So, uh, okay. I had a question about that, but now it's still in mind. I'll come back to it if it pops up. <laughs> um, That's fine. Oh, man. So... And this week, Tom, you had the um, Nissan Leaf and did like another 70 mile an hour range test. So actually, I didn't have it. I wrote um, the article, but Kyle oh, drove it. Oh, I see what's going on. <laughs> I did okay. the, I, yeah, I did, uh, Kyle has so many experiential events that he doesn't have time to write <laughs> his own article. So he'll like do something, he'll drive a car on a track or, or do a range test. And then he'll feed all the information to us, and one of us will write it up because he's out on the track doing more. Really, it's cool a great stuff. arrangement so, if you ask me. I think that yeah. works perfectly. <laughs> yeah, you want to be Kyle, put it that way. You don't want to be me sitting at my computer writing about what he did. 
In, in any event, <laughs> um, I did get a chance to do the the Nissan Leaf uh, R Inside EV 70 mile an hour highway range test, and that was on the Leaf Plus which has the larger battery. You can get the base leaf with a 40 kilowatt hour battery. The leaf plus has a 62 kilowatt hour battery. So two or three, maybe three months ago, I did the range test on that up here in New Jersey and got uh, 185.4 miles. And, but I had 1% of battery left. Where I do the range tests on the New Jersey Turnpike, I really have to time it where I'm, I've, uh, I'm just about out when I'm pulling into a, 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 a Electrify America charging station because there's no side streets. I can't um, pull off and drive the last four or five miles or get on the track like Kyle does and do the last few miles until the car won't roll anymore. Um, so I, I have to time it. And I usually do pretty good now. I get down under 2% most of the time and then just extrapolate the, the final mile or two based on the consumption. So when I did my drive, I got 185.4 miles and ended up with 1% battery left. So I said, you know, figure this is somewhere around 187, 188 miles total. Uh, Kyle went further as he pretty much always does because he drives it until it, he has to get out and push it. And he went 193.6 miles and drove it down till it was at zero, um, beyond zero. You know, the cars go uh, for a few miles after it reads zero or just dash, dash, dash. So, um, you know, combining those two, I did 185, he did 193. Uh, uh, we, we're averaging it out and just calling it 190 miles. Uh, when we do two 70-mile highway range tests, we average the result of both. Uh, I think that's the most fair way to do it. And now we're kind of building up uh, a catalog of the EVs that we've tested. We're up to, I think, 11 now cars that we've done. And many of them, Kyle and I have both done the range tests. So we get an average of the two. We're always very close our results i think when kyle passed one percent battery when i stopped he was right at 185 or 186 so you know we we repeated the tests in two different um you know states with even different temperature and kyle even had an extra passenger in his time so you would have thought that carrying that extra 140 150 pounds um and it easy, was hot easy. it was hider at would have would have would have dropped it down but he actually ended up with the consumption rating a little bit better than mine, 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour, and I ended up at 3.4. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's that's Nissan Leaf with the uh, 62 kilowatt hour battery. 56 kilowatt hour is usable. Uh, you could figure pretty, you could pretty much rely on about 190 miles full to dead at 70 miles an hour in temperatures that are you know, in the 60s, 70s, somewhere around there. Obviously, when it once it gets colder, you're going to get less mileage. Hey, are we going to do some cold weather, cold weather, 70 mile an hour testing? Sure. Why not? You know, it's... Yeah, but Tom, we haven't actually talked about this. Are, we should classify a hot weather and a cold weather range test. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think that's 100% right. The problem is, if you look at the comments um, uh, on our range tests... People are like, well, why can't you do a, a, a 75 mile an hour range test at 40 degrees? And then somebody else will say, no, 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 no. Do a 60 miles an hour at 30 degrees where I live. Right. So, you know, I uh, would have to agree on what's the, the, the warm weather test conditions going to be and what are the cold weather con condition tests going to be. And it's difficult because we, we don't just have, uh, you know, a a pool of EVs at our disposal all the time where we can just say, okay, I'll grab these three this week and do these range tests. We have to arrange it with the the, the media uh, company, the um, uh, companies that manage these fleet uh, test drives. Kyle has access to a bunch of dealers down where he lives. He probably has a little bit better access that, than I do up here in New Jersey. I've got to arrange it through the drive shop or FMI who manages media fleet vehicles. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we should, Kyle. I think we should figure on um, uh, sort of uh, what's going to be the cold weather range test. Is it going to be at 10 degrees? Is it going to be at 30 degrees? Because that makes a big difference too. And if we start right. testing cars at, you know, okay, as soon as it gets under 40, we test a car and then we do another car a week later and it's 30 degrees colder. That's not an equal test. I think all these warm weather tests that we've done so far have been like between, you know, the high 50s and the 80s. Um, so it's 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 kind of, 
you know, while not perfect, uh, you know, the, 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 the battery managed system isn't working to, 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 to cool or heat the battery that much. And, um, you know, that you're not losing too much of the available energy because the battery was too cold. Yeah. yeah I, and I the other that, thing you have to think about when the batteries are cold, do we start with a frozen battery pack that sat overnight or uh, do we DC fast point. charge the cars and start with a warm pack? I mean, we really, we should sit down and think about this. That, you know, the, the answer that we'll give to everyone is it will never be scientifically repeatable or perfect, yeah. but yeah. it's going to be an idea of what you can get. And if we get enough cars that if we can range test everything in the winter that we range test in the summer, we can look percentages on each car and kind of just gauge how much you'll lose. Um, some cars with heat pumps, for example, might lose less in the winter time than mm -hmm. cars with resistive heating options. So we'll have yeah. to see. And uh, it is a lot of work. And as Tom mentioned, it's very difficult to get cars. For example, I've been trying to get an Audi e-tron for a year Me from too. Audi. <laughs> and uh, actually, I'm going to get one in in next week or the week after because a viewer of my out of spec channel is donating me his car for a week or two. Oh, nice. And it's like Audi, they have none in their press fleets. Jag has one eye pace in their entire fleet in LA. And, mm -hmm. and of course dealers don't want hundreds of miles on their cars. Mm -hmm. So I pull from the manufacturers and it's, it's very difficult to get cars where I live in North Carolina from manufacturers that are electric. We like pickup trucks here. Yeah. I agreed. It's hard in New Jersey too. the East coast in general is hard that the, the the media fleets don't carry a lot of EVs like they do in California. I, I mean, that's that's EV central for the U.S. That's where they sell like a third of the EVs in the country get sold in California. So it would it'd be a lot easier for us to get a media loan if if either of us lived in California. But we we somehow make do. We get the cars, and I agree. We need to figure out how to do this for the winter, and then start doing some comparisons my vote would be to cold soak the battery if we're going to do a cold uh you know a cold weather uh test then you know with no warming the battery up at a, at a dc fast charger you park it out outside overnight just let it cold soak and start off with it th that way yeah all right so moving on to the news of the week so after weeks and weeks of teases and some drops of some key info, the 2021 Lucid Air officially launched on Wednesday evening, and it's pretty sweet. We got some range, pricing, specs, and Tom, you're all over this thing. You got some, uh, so we, we know a bit about it already. We know it's like, uh, it's got the most range of any production EV so far. It's 517 miles of range for the top, top, uh, yep. <laughs> The biggest battery and it's also the quickest EV we've production EV we've seen it's not actually well production they don't have a production version of it quite yet but actually I understand the, the production version might be even quicker than this 9.9 .9 second time that they put out at the quarter mile so and they also have charging speed which was uh, it's above 300 kilowatts and so about uh, was 200 miles and or 300 miles in 20 minutes I think can do so that kind of Man, man, it's uh, beats beats the Model S out and comes in at like a hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars for the top Dream Edition version of it. And uh, I think you know, tell us more about this, Tom. If people want this, uh, first of all, if people want this, uh, tell us about the uh, the deposit for the Dream Edition. So the Dream Edition deposit I think, is five thousand dollars. Right. Um, for any of the other editions, it's one thousand right. dollars. And um, you know, one of the things that we really came out of this whole launch is how Lucid is so um, intensely focused on efficiency. You know, and they talk about efficiency, not just powertrain efficiency, uh, space efficiency. They, they, they talk about how incredibly compact their, their uh, uh, drive units are. Uh, two and a half times, they take up two and a half times less space then say uh, uh, the I think they they never really referred to Tesla. They called the leading competitor, but uh, right. then Tesla's drive unit. So imagine that it's two and a half times smaller the drive unit than 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 Tesla's drive unit. So it weighs a lot less. That makes the car more efficient. It gives you more room to package for the interior, which the air has the the largest uh, interior, most interior passenger and cargo space of, of any vehicle in its class. Uh, it has something like 
three times the luggage space of a Mercedes S class, which has, you know, two times or three times. I, I don't know exactly what the number was, but that it, a lot more luggage space than a Mercedes S class, which is kind of like the, the standard for the uh, uh, luggage space in, in that class of vehicles. Uh, the frunk is incredibly large. Uh, it's, 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 you, I think they posted where you could fit f frunks of four of the, co of competing vehicles inside the Lucid's frunk, like a Model S, a Model 3, a Jaguar I-Pace, and I think it was a BMW i3. The, the, the volume of all four of those frunks can fit inside the volume of the frunk on the Lucid Air and still have space left over. So, uh, you know, the, the, it's the most efficient vehicle. It charges the fastest. It goes the furthest. It has the most interior passenger space, the most interior cargo space, has the lowest drag coefficient. They just, everything they did, they, they seem to, to, to do better than anybody else. Now, yeah, it's not on the market yet. And we have a lot of people commenting saying, well, it's not going to be out for another eight or nine months. Do you think the, the other manufacturers are just going to sit still for these eight or nine months? No, of course, they're not going to sit still. But What's happened in the last in the last eight or nine months that manufacturers have made such quantum leaps forward that they're going to in the next eight or nine months? You know, uh, you know, Tesla, the 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 uh, the EPA rated range on the Model S increased. Um, that's one thing that where they moved forward. But what else has has anybody else done to to make us lead to believe? Oh, by the time this thing launches next summer, it's going to be old news because everyone's going to pass them. That just isn't going to happen. You know, this is yeah. this is going to launch and it's it's in, you know and 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 have top specs on many of these important categories and we got to give it to 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 Rawlinson. They really seem to have knocked it out of the park with this car. It's it's a fantastic car. Yes, it's very expensive, but they have a plan to the next iterations it's going to get less expensive and less expensive. Within uh, two years, I think they're going to be their projection is they're, they're going to have a version of this air to cost less than ninety thousand dollars. That's still very expensive. But look, and I chatted with Rawlinson about this a couple of weeks ago. You know, that's that's the only way you can. It's possible to launch a, a, a new car company is go from the top down. You know, uh, the first vehicles have to be these very expensive vehicles with high profit margins to drive down the cost so that you can introduce less expensive models in the future take tesla for instance you know they, they they sold very expensive vehicles for the first you know 10 years that they were that that, that they were making cars uh, until they were able to introduce the model 3 so um that's that's the blueprint that's what you have to follow and from what we've seen from lucid so far they're, they're, they're going to be a force to reckon with right say so, hey kyle so what do you what do you like about this car uh, okay, that's a loaded question because I really like so much. Everything on paper is amazing. I mean, look, it, Tom really hit everything that I was going to talk about. It, it's just the – it is uh, – beats out Tesla in almost every measurable category. It is uh, so much space on the inside. It's stupid fast. It uh, charges really fast. It's all really good, but what I'm interested in is in, in two things. First off, the tri motor variant has not been released yet. They've teased it, and so are they waiting until Tesla's battery day to see if Tesla launches some three motor thing and then smack that down or have a comparable? We're not sure. Uh, either way, I think that's going to leave open a lot of possibilities because keep in mind the Dream Edition is not the top trim on this car. Also, the Dream Edition goes. 14 miles less on a charge than the Grand Touring Edition uh, has a lot more power, but I'm not, there's definitely something going on. They're both the dual motor configuration, uh, but there's something to make it lose power and it could just be purely wheel design, but I, I would go for the Grand Touring version, 139,000, I think, and some change, and you get the 517 mile range. That seems good. Um, but, but if I think about it this way, I really do believe they're reasonably priced for the specs you'd get. Uh, you know, Model S just a couple years ago, P100D was one hundred and sixty four, one hundred and sixty five thousand dollars. That car went three hundred and fifteen miles on a charge, same zero to sixty, way less nice interior and less functionality. And here we are, a few years later, saying, "Hey, for the same price, you can get a measurably better vehicle in every single category." 
I, I think their pricing is spot on. If anything, I think they're, uh, it just shows how expensive Tycon is when you go to max that thing out. Right. Uh, because I, I just spec the Tycon up to like $230,000. If you ever wonder what I do in my free time, I play around in the Porsche configurator building Porsches all day. And uh, yeah, I got a Tycon. I was like, let's just max this baby out. I'm like, 230. Oh my God. So, um, you know, paint to sample key and everything. Lucid's taking the right approach. I can't wait to go cannonball one of these things and break my record. That'll be pretty cool. Just to, just to smash down the record. I think I'm going to try and do two runs. I'm going to do for the least amount of charging across the country. So go really slow and do like, uh, you know, four charges, I think would be the goal to get across the country, something like this. So, and then uh, do another one for speed. So what you're saying then, this is a, uh, a Taycan killer? No, it's different. I think Tycon's still going to have their their ownership base. I mean, the Tycon's a yeah. really tactile, great driving product. Um, but and it looks Tycon, better. Yeah, yeah. The thing I don't like the styling on the air at all. Sorry about oh, really? that. Yeah, the exterior or interior. Both? Oh no, the interior is amazing. It's yeah. the exterior, especially that trunk capsule. Yeah, that whatever you call thing it. going on. Yeah, I, think it, think I don't about, know if it's. Is you it know, because it, like the lines are in different places now? Then, like in the front, like the you don't have the hood lines down the front anymore. They're like on the side and in the back. You get this clamshell trunk thing, so the the shut lines are like down the side instead of the back. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's just like we're it. not used to looking know. at it, or or it's just I don't know. It's bad. And then also, you I don't know if you've driven around, but there's something called a Camry dent, and people who are into cars will know what this is. And it's every Toyota Camry has a dent in the same spot on the corner. Uh, and, and it's every single one. And so think about how expensive a Camry dent is going to be on this thing. You just got to replace the whole big clamshell every time you you hit someone in the quarter. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Camry doesn't have all the sensors that this is going to have. Okay, anymore. okay. But it's stop the backing other... up and hitting things. So <laughs> that will help. I don't mind the design as much. I like the functionality of it. When that trunk opens up, right. it's a huge opening. Um, that allows you to more easily put stuff, you know, in and take stuff out. So, you know, I, yeah, it at first, you know, it kind of looks odd, but I think that's something you'll get used to. Um, you know, if, if especially if you owned it, looked at, looked at it every day, it's truly, you know, form following function. Um, yes. It's, 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 you know, absolutely that. And, and I, I don't think Lucid is hiding that, you know, that, you know, the, the car, uh, had to be extremely aerodynamic. They wanted to have an enormous passenger compartment by pushing the the front of the passenger compartment forward and the rear back. So the interior is huge. So that's why you get that kind of very short stubby hood, um, very short rear trunk area, and this huge center section of the vehicle rather than you know, most s sedans today, uh, luxury sedans have these big, long swooping hoods and a trunk in the back that, you know, extends a few feet behind the, the vehicle. You don't get that with this. You get like this huge passenger compartment and a short stubby hood and trunk area. And, you know, in order to accommodate that, they had to think out of the box and come up with, you know, unconventional designs. And that's probably part of why the trunk um, has that clamshell type of a design. And talking about the price really quick, I know we touched on that before. And Kyle, you mentioned the Taycan is so expensive. I was at a BMW dealership yesterday. I did dealer training. And there were like three or four M8s on the parking lot that were all in the 160s. So, you know, right. uh, and and honestly, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really cool car, the, the M8. But I would take one of these Lucid Airs in a heartbeat over it. I mean, even if That's even nice. if it was gas, even if it was a gas car, you know, um, just vehicle to vehicle. Uh, I, I would take it over it. So, you know, yeah, that's it's a really expensive car. Not a whole lot of people can afford that. But there are enough people that can that, that shop at, at, at that um, level to buy these cars because all the manufacturers have vehicles up in that price stratosphere. And I think value wise, what you get for the Lucid at 160 is much more than what you get for a lot of the uh, legacy OEMs vehicles that are in that stratosphere. It's hard to say, it's hard to talk about like a price tag of $169 and say it's reasonable, but in in this case, it, it really is compared to what's out there. It, like like uh, Kyle was saying, it was just like uh, a month, eighteen months, two years ago, the Tesla Model S, uh, full ludicrous 
Tesla model was more ex more expensive than this. So, and, and this is a significant. Yeah, and I think we should be focusing on the uh, yeah the grand touring pricing. I think that's going to be the one to have, or even just the touring the you know the four hundred and six mile or five hundred and seventeen mile range. I don't think the difference between eight hundred and a thousand eighty horsepower is really that big of a deal. Uh, you know, you're scaring yeah. anyone you put in the car. I, I really I don't see the argument for the Dream Edition for thirty thousand dollars more. I think you just wait, let them figure out their production stuff a little bit, get the cars out, and then go for the touring or the grand touring. I think for ninety five grand, this is so much car. For one hundred and thirty, if you need that extra hundred miles, sure. But I don't even think many people do. I think you'd be good with the less than hundred thousand dollar one before tax credits, and that's sure. when we're like, it's not bad. It really isn't bad pricing. Right. I think when you're talking about cars in like above a hundred thousand dollars, you know, 10,000, 20, 30, even $30,000 might not be a showstopper for a lot of these kind of customers, you know, because they obviously have resources that, you know, but yeah. So it should be interesting to see now if, uh, Martin, what, what are the chances you think that, uh, 11 days from now on the Tesla's, uh, battery day, uh, that they'll have something that comparable to this. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if anything on Battery Day will change uh, because of of this. You know, the industry is pretty tight, so Tesla would have known most of what Lucid were going to unveil. Um, but I wonder if there's a few tweaks to Battery Day. I remain look. I remain convinced that Battery Day was always going to be about manufacturing, like mm -hmm. Elon's obsession. No, that, that that came out. That's the wrong word. But Elon's passion at the moment is is manufacturing. You know, building the machine that builds, the, builds machine. the machine. Yeah, like so. You know, I see a lot of commentary of, oh, you know, on Battery Day we're going to get an update on Roadster and Plaid Model S. And whilst those things may happen, I think that you know, oh, and 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 then they throw around phrases like million mile battery, which is out. You know, we have those already. Um, and then you know, solid state. And so people are getting worked up into a frenzy of uh, of all this and i think you know because battery day is investor day as well it's two events in one yes. and i think it's about the future of i think that's about the future of tesla and i think tesla are going to say you know what would the the acquisitions that don't get talked about very more uh, very much um like people talk about the maxwell acquisition because it's kind of interesting um battery technology but people don't um really talk about uh, things like Groman, which they bought in Germany a, uh, a, a few years ago now, and, and it was Groman Engineering and rebranded to Tesla Groman Automation. Uh, but, you know, it's a it's a 300 people in Germany spending their entire time working on... Well, th so this company used to work with all the German car... Well, all car makers to make their factories better factories, and then Tesla bought them and cancelled all the contracts and went, no, now you, you know, now we have all of that brain power on, on us. So, you know, you've got that. Um, and then you've got, uh, I forget the name of the Canadian acquisition, but it's a cell, cell manufacturing acquisition a year ago. And, and, you know, I think battery day and investor day is really going to be about Tesla saying, this is our future on a three to five year of we've worked out how to manufacture cells at a, you know, a, a, at whatever level they're doing. So, um, there'll be some tech stuff in there. There'll be stuff about the cars. I think people sure. will be di disappointed if they're expecting to see a, uh, you know, because we're not going to get any more product launches from Tesla. Elon said that. And so I think if people are tuning into that, expecting a kind of event like we had this week with Lucid, I think people will be disappointed. I think this is Tesla saying, like, here's us as an engineering company, and, and here's how we're going to make cells, and here, we've worked out how to do this. And so um, I think it's going to be more hardcore engineering than than our car goes two tenths quicker which will be part of it but hey i'm probably going to be wrong so uh we look forward to that i wonder if anything's gonna you know gonna change because of what looted um have done there'll be certain things that that i don't i don't think will that that, that will impact you know some of the stuff that right. i was most impressed with lucid like the connected the connected uh nature of the car building in that amazon technology now right. I, I went away and had a look at some of the the, the, the market impact I around the world, and um, I don't think the Amazon. I think you guys have more of the Google devices, as in terms of the market share. Uh, but over here, like Europe, really, really loves the Amazon devices, and I won't say her name because everyone watching will. will I have one. Of, <laughs> I have. I have one in every room. Isn't she's not plugged in? But I have one in every room, and so. Um, 
like our whole life is just doing our shopping list on this. I add stuff, and then I'm out shopping, and my wife's added stuff, and it's just it's on our phones, and you know we're we're so to have that in the car as well is amazing, so that we can just talk we can talk to our Amazon devices through the car. So that connectedness, um, the vehicle to grid stuff that I was really impressed in vehicle to home, yes. vehicle to grid, vehicle to vehicle. Uh, the fact that Lucid have worked really hard on on. Uh, they called it the Wonder Box, uh, which is yeah. you know a nice marketing name. Which is but, like the two-way charger, basically, right? Yeah, it's like a you know uh, it's a it's it's a step step up charger for when you're using 400 volt uh, DC to DC conversion and v and and and, and bidirectionality. All of that, like you know, if Tesla weren't going to announce it in two weeks, they can't announce it now. I don't think you know on a, on a, again on a long term scale, will Tesla one day look to in use look to make the most of that embedded battery capacity in the world we know this year they'll make half a million cars but next year they'll make one and a half million cars uh with berlin and texas open so at some point will texas uh will will tesla look to open that up and use all of that storage that's embedded around the world to say hey give us 10 percent of your battery and we'll give you whatever in return and then they become a virtual power plant yeah possible maybe one day but that won't be battery day um so all of those, you know, all, all those things won't be won't be impacting on battery day. And then the and then the other things like the focus on like did you guys notice how much the focus is on on quality? Again, without ever aiming <laughs> shots at Tesla, like I, it seemed like they, they didn't go about a minute and a half without uh it was it was a bit like an Apple presentation, but it, but without saying quality and uh, right. quality and uh, quality and and you know there was a, a phrase one of the the VP of engineering or like the guy in the presentation said we're not going to chase numbers for the sake of just making cars we're going to make the cars well and then they had the uh, the the their head of design and it's like we really think about the angle of the stitching and I felt you know I thought Tim Cook was going to come out and go this is the thinnest iPhone ever so it was really. Like Tesla can't just turn themselves into, hey, we're going to launch a hundred and eighty thousand luxury uh, uh, dollar sedan all of a sudden. So th it, they pitched it well. They pitched it against Tesla, but far enough away to say, look, you know, we're going to have these studio spaces that are like a lounge and very luxurious, and come along and use our VR headsets and all that. And 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 then you've got Elon saying. You know, we're closing all our stores. No, we're leaving them all open. We love retail. No. And then, like, they just don't have... It was just a very, very pole star presentation. So, you know, I think Tesla will just play to their strengths and all the things they're amazing at, which will be the cell production, whereas Lucid don't need to do that at the minute. They just need to... They mentioned their cell partner, which I think is LG Chem, isn't it? So, like, best... Like, it's tier one best of the best out there if it is lg but I, they didn't mention them by name but they were like you know our cell partner and so right. that's as you know that's as good as you need to get in the world they're like their technology is fantastic so it was it was really impressive it was it was up against the opposition but also at arm's length and they 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 were they, they carved out their niche and and they're going for it so awesome and there's still more stuff we haven't talked about more stuff. Oh, uh, okay, right. Well, like the bonus, like the bonus at the end, right? We were like, right. Yes. So I guess you're talking about Project Gravity. Oh yeah. I mean, we all knew the, it was cut. Well, we saw we saw the leaked shots. So right. But it's right. but it, again, talk about Apple presentations, Steve Jobs, and one more thing, and uh, right. and that was it. Was exactly it. It was it was brilliant. It was like oh, and by the way, here's our next one. Um, I would have liked to have seen a, li a little more of that, but it was exciting. Yeah, well, there's a few shots. Um, I believe we have them up in a post. Um, so if you go to Inside of Ease and type "lucid" in the search uh, field, you'll you can you'll find this article. Behold, Lucid's Project Gravity SUV as efficient as the Air Sedan. So they leaked out a uh, leaked out. They they showed us a few different shots of the and, and in motion actually too they have a, a you know and we saw it a couple of weeks earlier there's some spy shots but they have a fully or they have a functioning suv uh but they haven't given us any really details about like as far as when it will be available to launch or you know all they say that it's as efficient as the air sedan which is you know we're kind of remarkable because that's already a super efficient you know i think he said 15 percent more efficient than uh, the nearest competitor and so having like an SUV to have that same level of efficiency is kind of remarkable. 
Um, I'm still kind of, I'm same way with the looks of this. I'm not, it doesn't really strike me that, that great, but I don't know. Tom, you like the, you like the SUV? Well, it's, it's, an early, you know, it seems like it's kind of an early concept, but, uh, I don't, I don't mind it. I, I, I can absolutely see Lucid's design in that, you know, it's, it's 100% Lucid. It's like they right. took the, the air and just pulled the top of it and lifted it up, you know, and gave it a, a different, um, rear for the hatch. But yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of cool. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's, you could tell it's an early concept. You could tell that's, you know, they're, they're going to have to make some changes to bring that to production, but I, I like it. I think it looks cool. It kind of, um, evokes a little Rivian for me, a little mm. Range Rover, um, but with the lucid, um, you know, designing uh, design style in there. So yeah, I like it. I think it's cool. I, it's, I think it might grow on me. I don't know. What do you think, Kyle? You, how, how much do you like gravity? Uh, yeah, I personally prefer it way more to the air. I think it looks yeah. great. Uh, there's not an angle I don't love except a full side profile where the back of it uh, edges out. And you only could see that in their teaser video from their their presentation. It's almost like the top bit of glass. Yeah, it like angles back. I, I would prefer just a complete flat black flat back but i'm sure this is aero driven that's why uh yeah no pretty cool I, it's the one i'd get over the air personally uh, if i was to choose between the two which i'm not but that's yeah, what i, I, I would go like, for i kind of prefer the looks of it to the air myself i mean the, I, I'm, I'm hoping the air will grow on me a little bit because there are elements that i do like like the the two uh i don't know if you call them like indentations but the hood anyway has like a couple of like scooped out areas that i think add a nice character to it but the, uh, and I, I kind of like the, with the SUV that that roof, the, the D the D pillar, the way it comes back, like almost like a flying butcher's kind of thing, because the other pillars are blacked out, and this one's still in the like uh, polished aluminum or something going on there. So that's kind of yeah, neat. that looks cool. It's it's a cool looking car, no question. And I think it looks great with their roof box thing that they had right. uh, in their spy photos, and I hope that's like a little tent that pops out. I just I like it. I think it's cool. Now, do I like it more than a Rivian? No. The Rivian, I think they have just absolutely killed it with uh, adventure spirit design. That's what speaks to me. That's what I like. Uh, however, all of the tech in the Lucid might just be so good to sway me from the Rivian. Again, not that I'm shopping for a new giant SUV to drive around daily. I like my smart car. <laughs> right. But I wouldn't um, I wouldn't mind just reaching out to our viewers and our listeners around the world who who can fill me in on this. Now, if anyone uh, maybe it's a uh, a thing for Europe, anyone can fill me in when I was watching the presentation and I hadn't realized about the clamshell uh, boot design. Uh, which for our YouTube viewers is on screen right now. I'm absolutely convinced uh, that there is uh, there is a regulation to do with, and it might not be a US thing. Like you know, so many hatchbacks and so many boots open that the, the tailgate opens and the light um, it's sort of it, it's halfway across the light. Right. Uh, as oh, it, it is a regulation, in yeah, the and US. that's so that yeah. when so that when the when it's open. Uh, and you're parked on the side of the road and you've opened it, but you've got your hazards flashing or your lights on, that all of the lights aren't so that the drivers behind you at least see those lights. When that is completely open, are there no lights showing? Like, how does that tick that regulation box? They That's have open. two lights inside of the bumper, uh, just so, below the weather stripping on the boot lid, and yeah. those kick on when the trunk opens. Same with Mini Clubman, same with Chevy Bolt. Uh, there's a few cars that have a second set of lights on the inside, and this is one of them. I right. couldn't the, see the that I3 in the presentation. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. The i3 does as well. It switched to the bottom lights in the i3. Yep. Nice. Right nice. So, yeah. So, I don't know like a European thing or not, but that's, that must be everywhere. So, cool. Well, it's a, it's a hell of a design because, as Tom says, it just has all this huge, this big loading area. Um, it's not a, it's not as good as a hatchback for practicality, uh, but they did show the split fold rear seats at the back as well. And when that is completely open, although the floor the the, the floor the first level of the floor looked quite high, so I wonder about big like big objects. Maybe you have to uh, maybe you can lower the floor like you can in a lot of EVs. So, but a lot of storage in there. It's the front that's impressive, like how much you can get in get in there. Um, so very cool. Yeah. So. 
this first uh, the first Lucid Air Dream editions will be coming out this spring, and if you if you're a fan or if you've put down the deposit on them uh, on one, stop by the Inside EVs forum. We have a Lucid sub forum there, and we're, we uh, hopefully we can get some some de- um, order pre order holders to come in and you know let us know about their experience, and you know maybe if we can get enough of them, we can kind of track. It'd be nice to be able to track how many orders they're getting for which editions and things. So yeah, if you're a Lucid fan or if you have a pre order, please drop by the uh, Inside EVs forum Lucid section, and it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, before we move on from Lucid, I just wanted to bring attention to this uh, one rendering from uh, Inside EVs contributor Andre Nadelia. Basically, he's created a station wagon version of the air sedan, um, right? And th- did you see this, Martin? Is there? No, I think. Okay, it's a. I haven't. A, I haven't seen this yet. Is okay. that? Uh, There's uh, an article uh, called uh, "Lucid Air uh, Wagon is the Perfect S- yes, SUV yes, yes, Antidote." Yes. 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 Yeah. Please, so that, please, please stop buying SUVs. If we don't, if you don't need an SUV, please stop buying them because right. then the automakers keep making them. <laughs> um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, we just need more cars like this, don't we? Uh, yeah, just like an estate. Roof. Yeah. Just amazing. So what, whatever you want to call it, I'd call it an estate. You might call it a wagon. Some people would call it a fastback or a sportback. Either break. way. Yet shooting brake, please buy, make more <laughs> make more cars like this. This would be amazing because you want the experience of driving the car, and then when you look over your shoulder, you've you know you've got twelve kids and four dogs in the back. It's awesome. I've got to say, I like this better than either the sedan or the SUV. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's a great style, and actually, you know what? For aerodynamics as well, there's a, there's a a fair argument to make that it's pretty good for aero. Yes. True. And the interesting thing is everybody says they love station wagons, you know, right. in our comments section on the online forums, because we always see these renderings whenever like there's been Tesla renderings in station wagons and other vehicles. And the comments are like, make it, build it. We love it. Take but money. when manufacturers make them, they don't sell well. No one does. So, yeah. yeah right. So, you know, where are all these people that love these vehicles, uh, 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 you know, and uh, when when they're actually made and they don't sell. So that's why the manufacturers are going to make what sells. What's selling, Morton? SUVs. Yeah. You can tell people to stop buying them. It's not going to happen. People just, I don't know if they just feel like it's a better vehicle because it's bigger, because it's this bigger mass and they want to, you know, drive around something that feels like they're sitting in their living room. But they, they, that's what's selling and that's what manufacturers are just going to make are going to continue to make because they they need to make what sells i love this vehicle too you're never going to say it so sorry to disappoint everyone before we move on from lucid there's one last thing i want to point out we talked about how um you know is elon or is tesla gonna respond to lucid on battery day and one of the things that i think was glossed over was that rollinson actually i think um, had a little sub, not so subtle dig at Tesla uh, during the presentation when he talked about the fact that they're 20% more efficient than any of their closest competitors. Um, you know, the whole vehicle, the battery, the powertrain, everything, um, you know, per weight. And he, he mentioned something to the effect, I don't know the exact words of, of you know, you know that would that's kind of like if a competitor were to come out with a 20% increase in efficiency tomorrow like all they've done is caught up with us so like okay you know it it was almost like he was setting the stage like if tesla announces you know battery improvements anything less than 20 percent they're still behind us so let's see what happens uh i'm 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 sure elon uh, you know, we, we're questioning, is Elon going to respond or anything? I don't think he can help himself not to. There's already He's already tweeted some things in response to Rawlinson talking about how, uh, um, you know, he uh, he came in and just totally took over Model S and redesigned it and saved Tesla because the Model S was a disaster before they hired him. And that's something that he personally told me was that the Model S was a disaster before they Tesla hired him, when Elon hired him, brought him in to look at it, he told Elon, it's got to be scrapped. If you want me to do this, I need to start over, redo the whole thing. Um, and uh, and Elon said, do it. You know, here's the keys to the kingdom. Make make the Model S, and which which he claims he did. 
And, and then basically, Elon basically, tweeted that he didn't really do that. So basically, he he came in, and he re-engineered the chassis. I think what some people were trying to attribute him uh, doing the like the whole design, which was right. you know that was a more uh, originally Fisker and, and then uh, Hans. Right. Yeah, well, well, well I, what, what I'm talking about, what, what he told me in an interview, and I have to get my recording. I don't want to quote right. him. Uh, I want to quote him. And when I read an article on this, I'll quote him word for word. It basically was, he told Elon, you know, it, it's got to be scrapped. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 a, no, it's a disaster. You know, that, that's what he right. said. It's, it's a disaster. I need to redo everything. Right. So basically, um, the, cha- basically the chassis is what he was yeah. talking about though. Right. It's like, right. Well, not the- he didn't specify that to me. He said, right. okay. you know, I, I took a good look at the vehicle and right. it was a disaster. Right. And it, everything needed to be redone. Right. So, yeah, um, it seems that they've put together. You know, what I like about this as well is it's it just seems solid. Like through all of the crazy numbers and, and, and th- they didn't really use hyperbole in the presentation. In fact, they I think the most used phrase is until we ship a car. We've achieved nothing. He said it several yeah. times mm-hmm. in the video, in the press Q and A afterwards as well, and and so he was about humility and all that. But um, but actually, what is I think it's just a, a, a thousand horsepower. Tri motor could be thirteen or fourteen hundred horsepower. But through all of those crazy numbers and range, it just seems solid. Like they were talking about how they've designed the battery in a modular way because they want to make smaller EVs when they can afford to and that they've got a roadmap and they have planned for the next 10 years. And at some point, they've got to make smaller batteries, so they've made it modular. And they talked about the factory. And they were like, oh, look, one of the lucky things about a Greenfield site is we make a modular factory. So we have two buildings at the minute. One's paint and one's GA. And then... Um, and then General Assembly. Yeah, yeah. So, and then at some point, they said the factory is able to do a a, a ten x or a ten times increase. But for now, we just need this space, and we just start here. But when we're ready, it's modular and it gets bigger. And again, there was a few digs and like, oh, this is the like the best EV factory that's ever been built from a greenfield site. And I know what you mean, Tom. There was some very subtle digs, like yeah. saying, oh, you'd be you'd be mad to build an EV in an existing factory because it just it's just inefficient. You're just battling the space that you've bought. It's better to be a greenfield site. And there's so many, like, if you know the space and you know Tesla and buying the Numi plant and all that, there was actually, there was a bit of needle in there that I, I enjoyed, but maybe it's needless, but I enjoyed all the little spikiness and the snark. Yeah. It was a pretty great presentation. If you haven't seen it, That's we have good. the. If you haven't, if you haven't seen it, the, we have the video of the uh, whole presentation still up on the website. And uh, yeah, just it, type type Lucid in the search field, and there you go. It was almost <laughs> as good as the Cadillac Lyric presentation, but you know, that, <laughs> they set you? the bar very high. So <laughs> I'm I'm not going to touch that. So speaking of GM, though, uh, we've learned we woke up. I think it was Tuesday morning. We woke up and a lot of people were surprised to learn that the GM, General Motors, will manufacture the Badger electric pickup truck for Nikola Motors. Uh, and that includes supplying the batteries for them. So that was kind of an interesting. Uh, they're taking like a, a an 11% stake in Nikola. So that's about $2, $2 billion worth. And yeah, they're going to build up this pickup truck for Nikola and ship uh sell them the batteries you know the battery packs using the ultium batteries in it and uh yeah so nikola which at one point i believe had said something about uh had called itself the most vertically integrated company ever is maybe a little less vertically integrated than we had thought it was going to be uh kyle (laughs) <laughs> you have some thoughts about this? Oh, program? you're going to put me on the spot for <laughs> Nicola? Come on. I don't want to get sued. Thanks, Tom. Okay, Thank here's you, Tom. the deal. Um, so basically, uh, yes, GM has purchased an 11% stake in Nicola for $2 billion. I've remained factual and right. I've shared my thoughts. <laughs> so yeah. there is a picture of a Nicola. <laughs> so uh, so there's, like there's, a, a, there's, there's a rendering of a Nicola. Right. So. So uh, I think we've, we've covered this story pretty well. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, so even, uh, should we talk about the Hindenburg piece for a half a second? Well, just, just, just one sec. I just want to say, so sure. this came out, you know, this news came out, there was P, the PR, and then we had a call, and at least two report, different reporters asked, 
you know, wide to the GM and Mary Barra was on the uh, was on the call with the uh, uh, the chairman of Nicola Trevor Milton, who is like the public face of the company, the co-founder or founder basically. And yeah, people were just like, "Why, why, why, GM? Why, why, why do you need Nicola? I mean, obviously Nicola needs you because they don't seem to have this 500 kilowatt." A 500 watt hour per kilogram battery that they were talking about a little while ago and so they're going to use these batteries like why what's what what does gm get from this it was like, it's like man they were thinking about it i don't really know what gm gets from this except she she said that they were very enthusiastic yeah, well, yeah. So they get enthusiasm but they get some hype and they get I mean, who, uh, you know who, this who design. doesn't love you know who doesn't love enthusiasm so i it, you can't blame them really Right. So, uh, yeah, we're kind of short on time, so we can't really spend a whole lot. Of, but, you know. Uh, it's such a shame. Such a shame. Uh, such a, uh, maybe another time. It is, another it time. is a little weird. So, so yesterday, this report came out by this, uh, I don't know, it's a, some sort of short seller group. I guess it's some sort of outfit that looks for weaknesses of companies and short sells their stock. But they published a, a report on, uh, I think it's called the Hindenburg Group, kind of ironically as well. Uh, so they published this big report on, on uh, Nicola calling it a fraud and uh, making some pretty serious accusations. Yeah, Hindenburg research, it, which is kind of it's kind of ironic because you know Nikola is known for its hydrogen infrastructure, hydrogen kind of powered vehicles. So to have a an outfit called Hindenburg attack it, it's just it's kind of just well, life is weird sometimes. So Kyle, you had something to say about this? No, all, all I was going to say was we should bring it up. We should at least make it known to our viewers that they're, uh, you know, right after the GM launch, uh, Nicholas stock rocketed up. Yes. They uh, shorted bucks. the stock two days later after shorting a significant portion of the shares. Factually, they released this article, which has now driven the price down. Uh, I, I don't know for sure. It's not proven whether or not their accusations are correct or incorrect. Uh, but I did see somewhere in there, one of my favorites was that uh, Trevor uh, at Nikola, his brother that like paved the steepest driveway in Hawaii. And this was his biggest life accomplishment and now has a hundred million dollars in Nicola, you know, whatever doing stuff with them. I just was like, how do you go from paving a driveway in Hawaii to this? So anyway, the whole bunch of these, you know, countless stories about emails that were uncovered, they paid it. No question. They put a lot of time into it. Uh, is yeah. it all accurate? I'm sure they'll find things that aren't accurate in the report. I'm sure they'll find things that are accurate in the report. Basically, last night, Nicola said, hey, uh, no, sorry, Trevor Milton said, I'm staying up all night. I'm going to tweet out responses, give everyone a nice document. And then, of course, this morning he says, well, I'm not going to do that. We got the SEC involved. And so now we're going to have our, our legal battle and they're suing or but uh, not suing, but may potentially sue Hindenburg over this. So we'll see. Well, It'll be fun to watch it unfold. I, I'd like to actually see the SEC involved in this just because I'd like to have, because it's not right if a company can just come in and, and throw out a bunch of accusations and now the, the price has gone from like $50 a high from a couple of days ago. It's like crashed now to like $31 and 66 cents at the moment. It's down like $5, almost $6 today. And so if they're selling, you know, if they make their whatever transaction and make their profits 20 bucks a share off or however many shares because they put out this, you know, I expected it would decline anyway after that announcement. Mm -hmm. Usually, there's a big pop, and it'll slowly decline. But yeah, still, well, it'd be good to have this this whole thing, you know. And if Nickel has done something wrong, you know, they need to be held accountable as well. But yeah, it's a pretty interesting. The electric vehicle world is not really a boring place, you know. <laughs> it's kind of. I think we get the. Uh, People look at it and think, oh, it's kind of, you know, a lot of geeks and it's kind of, you know, techie things going on. But man, there's a lot of drama, you know. <laughs> well, it's starting to heat up now. We got a lot of rivalries coming. We have Lucid v. Tesla. We have Nikola v. Everyone Else. We have a whole bunch of really good stuff coming up. It's going to be a fun 2021, 2022 to watch everything unfold, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, we'll, speaking, we'll of, speaking of companies real quick, uh, hooking up. So I just want to touch on this, and we'll get to a, your, another big story here in a second. But so, uh, just this past week, uh, Tesla CEO Elon Musk was in Germany, and for like four days, checking out the factory, seeing how, seeing how things are going. But as he was leaving, he, you know, the plane stopped over another airport, and he got out, and he had got to hang out with the, the Volkswagen CEO uh, Dice, and they had a good time, and the, 
Uh, Musk drove the ID3 down a runway, you know, got to try out their car. And we learned that uh, Herbert uh, Dice has also tried out the Model Y, and he was impressed by it. So it's kind of it's kind of nice, and they underlined that there's not going to be any, uh, there's no deals, like at least immediately forthcoming from like this, you know, tete a tete, you know. Um, but it is kind of nice to see, you never, you know, like you never see the head of Ford and, and GM hanging out and trying each other's cars. So it's, it, and it, this could lead to some cooperation down the road. It's just like. Yeah, it's kind of nice to see, especially Musky so prickly sometimes when he, you know, dealing with other CEOs or other manufacturers. It was kind of nice to see him get along with somebody out there. Um, yeah. Dice has always been a complimentary of Elon. This isn't, this didn't right. just, um, you know, happen. Uh, th- th- he's he's gone out of his way in the past to not criticize Tesla and be very complimentary. So I think. Elon, you know, it was kind of warming up Elon to the fact that, hey, maybe, you know, maybe we can be friends. We, we don't have to be fierce competitors. But as you said, it is it is unusual to see something like this. And Elon didn't totally rip the ID3. I mean, he did um, talk a little bit about how it wasn't uh, extremely powerful at speed, at, you know, at highway right. speed. Right. Um, and and it's Dice, yeah. D- Dice told him, well, then you should try our Taycan if you want to be uh you know if you want power at highway speed um but uh you know it 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 can only mean that it opens the door to a possible collaboration in the future so which i think would be good yeah it's nice to see but so anyway so uh something else kind of happened this week um electrify america shut down a 500 mile charging corridor over labor day and didn't tell their customers or anyone in advance. And Kyle went to charge up and man, no bueno. What's going on, man? Yeah, pretty poor situation. I'd say Uh, essentially what's going on here are there are uh, a number of sites on the East Coast identified by Electrify America that have uh, basically poor statistics. They are either failing chargers or charging sessions aren't working or they're too slow. So basically what they're doing is they're upgrading this corridor. Now, in the midst of all this, I woke up one morning. I said, let me take this Nissan Leaf on a road trip I have on loan. Why can't I get anywhere? Why are they all offline? And uh, after doing some research, I'm like, well, I just charged at this station two days ago. Nothing has changed, but it's currently offline and won't charge the car. And so what they did is pulled down all of these stations that they're planning to upgrade preemptively and with i would say some warning a day at most uh i i don't think i saw any site that had more than a day of warning and that's just unacceptable we had people that had road trip down to florida for labor day weekend and now we're on their way back home on labor day to arrive at chargers that have been preemptively shut down for upgrades that hadn't started yet and these are not software upgrades these are full station in and out uh changes so that's the bad. Uh, and, and of course, understandably, I think I, I, you know, not necessarily threw him under the bus, but I was like, guys, you can't do this in a very public way. We ran the story and it shows them that, that you can't just mess around with this charging network. Now it is the public network. Anyone can go up to these uh, stations, plug in their credit card and charge their car. It is not a proprietary system. And it's literally the equivalent of shutting down 500 miles of gas stations for EV owners that rely on this network. So that was bad. They were rightly called out on it and it should never happen again in this way. We should have all gotten an email, alternate routes planned, things like this. You know, if Tesla were to do this, they'd pull up one of their nice 18 wheelers with a battery pack on the back of it and charge people's cars because that's how they do it. Um, So I, I thought it was very poorly executed. Now the upside and the benefit is hopefully higher station reliability higher throughput, faster chargers at all of these sites in the not too distant future. But some of these sites will be down for two, four, six, eight weeks, which means this travel route is going to be pretty difficult to get through. Now, I will say literally the day after I broke the story or two days after, now all of a sudden they're working on the station right down the street from my house suspiciously uh, very early. So I don't know if that was planned or just because they want to have some positive coverage, but I will say they are working on it. Um, it's not up back online yet, but I just thought it was funny how they were working on other stations 
and then came to the one by my house afterwards. Right. <laughs> they, they know where you live. They're coming for you. I believe yeah, they do. Like, they do. I believe yeah. it's like one manufacturer. There's like the it's like the cabinets from one manufacturer are just not that great. I guess so is what I, some, there are some comments in in the article. Right. Seemingly, one manufacturer's uh, stations are all being taken down and right. switched out with others. Yep. That's that's but, what it looks like at least. But that's good. I'm glad they've they're, they're taking that step and rec realizing that you know their their reliability to date has not been you know it's not been acceptable. But then, and and hopefully they've learned from also from this that you can't just shut down, you know, <laughs> dozens of chargers without you know letting your customers really, really, really know ahead of time, you know, so they right because it's I, it, I mean it's real deal now. People are relying on this network. Oh, yeah. I think they're thinking, oh. you know, it gets real when Mach E, when Rivian, when Lucid yeah. hit the roads. It's no, it's real today. Right. People rely on this network, right. and you can't just mess around with that. I think they're thinking, oh, it'll probably start next year when things get serious. Absolutely yeah. not, and uh, that's why we ran the story. And I think yeah. it, uh, you know, it wasn't ever super negative about it. It's just like, guys, this this isn't how it should happen. Yeah, Repu wow. reputation is a, a very important thing, and you know, I think Electric Fire America has to really concentrate on that aspect. You know, the reputation for reliability—it's like really it's going to be like the number one non-Tesla fast charging network. You know, the way things are looking right now. So they, it's, electrification itself kind of depends on them being reliable, right? Right, Tom? Absolutely. I I actually have an interview scheduled next week with. Uh, the CEO of Electrify America. And um, it was for a different topic, but uh, this will be discussed. And I need an answer as to why this was, sh why they did it the way they did it. Why did they shut down everything preemptively at once? Why couldn't, when, a, when the truck rolls up to upgrade a specific site, they shut it down uh, at that moment? Well, why did the whole corridor have to be shut down, you know, days or weeks before any of the stations? actually start to get work done uh was there some sort of safety problem that they 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 can't they realize now and said we've got to shut these down right now because it could be a problem um uh, you know uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna get an answer on that uh, uh and that's the thing that bothers me more than anything i'm all for upgrading it um there's been huge reliability problems with electrify america we all know that we've documented it all the readers have documented it if Electrify America is making this enormous investment in replacing these units that are less than two years old, uh, yeah. they must be confident that they're going to be a lot better than the stations that are in the ground. They wouldn't be spending, you know, you know, millions of dollars on, on swapping these stations out if they were slightly better. They, they right. better be a lot better. Uh, but we still need an answer as to why did they have to turn them all off? but well before they were starting to work on them. So hopefully I'll get that answer and we'll be able to chat about it next week on the podcast. Right. Well, can... Yeah, that'll be really interesting because uh, I spent you know a, a long time on the phone with Giovanni with uh, their comms team, but it was pretty much off the record. Can't really share a lot what they say. I'm very much looking forward to your on the record response uh, to these hard questions because I got the, of course, just the, the general, uh, I, I will say they were very upfront about everything, but, but nothing ever related to a safety issue, which still, uh, you know, at least that they communicated to me and I, I feel they were being very forthcoming. So, um, it still leads to like, why would you just take this down? It makes no sense. And I think what they were thinking was they don't want to have people relying on stations that are not satisfactory, but like you've been doing this for the past two years. So what's the <laughs> difference today? You know, like, come that's on. That's not acceptable. That's right. uh, there's stations all over the country that are not reliable. I mean, we get reports from all over the country where, where they're have, they're still having issues. And just just to shut off this whole corridor with a day's notice, that that you know, you know, I know what they said was off the record to you, so you can't obviously speak it to that now. But you and I need to have a conversation before I talk to them because I want to hear what they told you, uh, and 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 the fact that they wouldn't let you explain why they they had to shut them all down at once before they needed to start working on each one. I just I, I right. somebody it wasn't has even to explain that, that to me. 
You know, I, yeah, it wasn't even that they wouldn't explain it to let me explain it. They didn't explain it to me. I mean, even on the whatever, you know, we had just we didn't really talk about anything too crazy. I, I would say nothing that I would share yeah. would be bad or good. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's truly mind boggling how they would go about a rollout. If I was doing this, I would replace two out of the four stations at most of these sites at a time. So yeah. you have half that are working and half that are not. And, you know. It just sucks if you're working on the chat mode and that's the only option. Just wait an hour. We'll replace the stations and you'll be good to go. I mean, that's how I would do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it makes you want, I'd like to, you know, <laughs> I don't mean to be uh, particularly cynical, but I'd like to go and look at the, the car park of the head offices of Electrify America, because when you, when you drive an EV, when you drive a non Tesla EV, it, it's just unthinkable that an entire route, a corridor, would all be clear, whether it was preemptively, I mean, that also sucks that, that they turned it off and then there wasn't immediately an electrician waiting there and, a you know, a, a lift out the old one, yeah. put in the new one, turn it on again. Like, even an hour. Like, that that's frustrating. But the mindset, you, you know, because driving an EV is a behavioural change as much as it is anything else. And so, just the mindset that when the first meeting was held virtual meeting these days all by by zoom and uh and 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 uh, uh dave in the infrastructure department says guys i've got an idea we switch it all off at once like the immediate response is dave stop it you're talking madness again you can't turn off a corridor like it's a mindset so at some point someone shuts that conversation down and go like no because if that were me I'd then be stranded with my family and out of electricity. Uh, and it's, it, it is a little bit weird because it, it, it's, it's not a decision that you would make if you drove an EV. Now, obviously, some people who work at Electrify America do drive EVs. So I just, or whether they just thought it'll be fine, it'll be okay, they'll find another charger. It's a little bit strange. So, hey, I'm looking forward to hearing Tom's interview because uh, I, I, obviously they're pretty embarrassed about this. So, And Mark, right. there's one thing that you left out, though. In addition to all that, they did it on the one of the busiest holiday oh. weekends of the year. I forget because we don't we don't have Labor <laughs> yeah, Day here, so yeah. we don't have that holiday. So it was a normal it was a normal working Monday for me. Yeah. So uh, what would the, the the equivalent here would be? Yeah, like uh, here uh, Easter is a Friday and a Monday. Yeah. So uh, so so yeah, like Good Friday and Easter Monday, uh, most of people will take both days off work and head away with the family long weekend and you're right if all of a sudden it was that i forget labor day yeah yeah wow it was like what could what the worst time we could do this you know, what, you know what would be yeah, the absolute worst okay either thanksgiving labor day memorial day um wow. okay we got to do it on one of those three holidays you know like it's yeah. it's amazing i mean you know too bad they couldn't uh, uh, i mean i'm sure they would have loved to have done this during the early months of covid because nobody was driving. No one right. would have even noticed except me because I drove down to see Kyle in, in North Carolina and empty highways during, during, uh, dur during the early days of COVID. But um, it, it just, it's mind numbing to me. Everything about this is just, somebody has to explain to me why this was done this way. Right. So we're out of time, but um, I just want to hit one, one more thing. I just want to hit on real quick before we left, before we leave. Uh, GMC, um, they revealed their Hummer EV logo yesterday, and it's a giant crab. Um, and they say they put it out in a tweet that said, "Real revolutionaries forge their own direction, own direction." Get it? Get it? So this crab, this crab thing, it's like I guess it's really underlining the fact that the Hummer EV will have this thing called crab mode, which I'm not exactly sure. They haven't really said anything about it yet, but you know, in my mind, it means the thing is going to be able to go sideways somehow and probably only on dirt because the only way you could do that is by having real world steering. And then the, you know, to go sideways, you'd have to have the, all the wheels kind of pointing in that direction and then turning at in, in the different direction. So the front wheel, the front wheels will be turning backwards and the back wheels will be turning frontwards and the whole thing is going to somehow, you know, go sideways anyway. Can you pull that logo back up really quick? So uh, what <laughs> struck me about it was take a look at the six white sort of arrows around the corners uh -huh. of that. 
that um. to me made it seem like they're saying the vehicle can travel in those six directions. What do you guys right. think? Uh, you're smart, man. That's why you're on the podcast, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice that. Even man. so, this should not be the logo of their car. <laughs> it is terrible. GM, what are you doing? You're losing your mind. This should, You're yeah. buying Nicola. You're doing this stuff. You're not making anything exciting. They just need to go and hit the big reset button, I think. I mean, yeah. I, crabs are pretty exciting, you know. In, well, okay. This should not be the, this should yeah. never be the, the logo of any car company uh, ever. I mean, if you stick your hand in a bucket of crabs, I can tell you that's pretty exciting. But, uh, <laughs> I kind of agreed it, but does anybody think that I might be onto something with those six arrows or am I well, just yeah, reading no. too, too uh, much into a, a, a crab logo? <laughs> no, I, I think that, I think that's a, a very excellent point actually. And I just wonder if they'll be able to crab without turning the wheels. I think there's a way you can spin individual really? motors to make the car do this type of thing. I was thinking, it, work, it's trying to work it in my mind exactly how, you know, but I can't yeah, do but it with I'm, the back wheels. I'm fairly wheels. certain I've seen it at some point where you can rotate wheels in a certain direction and it will just go like this. It, it scrubs tires, of course. You're going right. to be, you know, uh, losing grip. It'd be it's much better on dirt. Road. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I think that's a better solution, especially if they're going to go with this in hub motors, like the Lordstown thing. We'll see how they mm. do all this. Um, that they'll have the ability to do this type of thing. Right. I think they don't have they don't have in hub uh, hub motors. They have big, you know, traditionally center mounted motors. Um, but I believe they do have no. They only have three of them, I think, on the Hummer. So uh -huh. they, they can't do the tank turn like the Rivian can, which has one motor per wheel. So they can't spin in place, but but sideways, which you know could come in handy, I guess, off road. Anyway, we're out of time, gentlemen. Um, so that brings us to the end of our show. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you have any comments on any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post, the YouTube comment section down below if you're watching on YouTube, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. Uh, oh, let me just circle back real quick. Um, the we have a Hummer EV forum. So if you're a fan of the Hummer, or and you have plans on getting one, you know, come let us know about it, and we'd like we'd certainly like to share your enthusiasm for it. Uh, so don't forget, you can find and follow all of our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. At <laughs> Martin is at EV News Daily, and uh, Kyle is at Auto Spec Motoring. I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications, and we'll see you all next week. Ciao.